going to talk about something uh, that has to do with all of us here, and that's citizen space and what NASA is doing about it. But first, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't play our, our new hit single, so I'm going to do that. Things are looking good. I'm going to pilot tree. Vehicle reports entry interface. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere uh, as we go in here. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth feet. Universal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. Parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Feet shield sep has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers descending. Standing by for batch shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single dive, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on live. So I had the real honor to be uh, present at that, uh, that event, and uh, one of the things I remember feeling, which I think all of us have felt uh, soon after that, is uh, a real sense of optimism, a sense of what the future can bring, and the fact that we're part of it right now. I mean, we're living that, that future. Um, it's actually the same kind of impression I had walking around the Maker Fair yesterday and this morning. There is so much optimism here, and it really kind of, frankly, restores my faith in the future. It really does. Uh, there are times, especially when the economy is in kind of a dump, uh, that we question how far we'll be able to go and how fast. And uh, again, what I saw over the last couple of days makes me think uh, very far and very fast. So Curiosity, uh, the rover, uh, has been walking around or, or, or traveling around on Mars. Uh, one of the things that uh, happens, of course, is we like to take credit for this whenever we can. Uh, NASA is proud of what it's accomplished, and so is the Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, which is operated by Caltech and funded by NASA. Uh, this image right here is a close-up of the track marks from the first test drive of this Curiosity rover. And if any of you can read uh, Morse code, and I, maybe that's a lost art, I don't know. Who here knows Morse code? Anybody? Actually? Great. Good for you. Well, if you know it, uh, and if you ever make it to Mars someday, <laughs> and if the wind hasn't obliterated the, the signs, you'll be able to read the letters JPL uh, from the tracks of the rover as it travels across the red planet. Uh, so we're kind of tagging Mars. Uh, as, as we go by. Uh, so that's kind of a neat evidence of our presence. This apparently came about because the JPL wanted to have its logo right there on the, uh, on the arm, and NASA said, uh, maybe not. And JPL said, okay, no problem. We'll, we'll come up with some other, other way to do it. And so they did. Now we, have, we will have hundreds or thousands of JPLs over, all over Mars, which is, which is very cool. So anyway, good for JPL. Um, you know, I'm here to talk about technology, and I want to say something about that in connection with Mars. I mean, the science that's going to come out of Curiosity is going to blow our minds. I mean, already just a couple of days ago, NASA announced that Curiosity landed, it turns out, in the middle of an ancient riverbed on Mars. And we see evidence of that alluvial flow coming down from the mountains and from, uh, from across the plains there. And you see, we're right in the middle of all that stuff. There's going to be some great science coming out of that. 
Uh, but it's also uh, technology success. And I don't know how many of you have seen this on YouTube, but that picture in the lower left there, that's actually a frame out of a fairly long sequence taken from uh, the Curiosity spacecraft as the heat shield dropped off during descent. And you can see this heat shield kind of uh, spiraling down toward the surface of Mars. And uh, I don't think you can see it, but I can kind of imagine a little puff of red dust. You can't see it, I'm pretty sure. Um, but one of the things that struck me about this, uh, this experience of seeing the video and being this close up to all this, uh, this great accomplishment in technology is just how close we can be to this right now. You know, uh, 10 years ago or so, a little less, uh, when we launched the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, the Mars Exploration rovers, um, we had nowhere near the kind of infrastructure that we have now to be able to do things like take a picture of the parachute from orbit from another spacecraft, to be able to watch this in digital high def as this thing uh, uh, reached the red planet. Uh, I'll tell you one of the things that um, I remember, one of my earliest memories was uh, going out with my dad to buy our first TV set to watch the Apollo landing. And I think where we are right now is the same kind of thing, but now this streams right to your computer. So uh, once again, make, making, uh, making technology part of us and us part of technology, that's one of the things we're trying to do at NASA. My office is the office of the chief technologist. Uh, we've done a number of things to try to reach out and I think successfully engage the non-traditional offerers of technology, being able to work with everybody, the other 99%, if you like, um, rather than what we have been doing in the past. One of those ways is through prizes and challenges. I'll say more about that in a second. Um, on the upper right there is a picture of the Pipistrel aircraft. This is a hybrid electric aircraft. Uh, it's a recent competition. There was, I think, $1.6 million prize purse for this. Uh, our goal was to be able to move toward the technology that would someday get us to achieving a, an aircraft capable of 200 miles per gallon per passenger. We call them passenger miles per gallon. So the winner of this competition blew everybody else away and achieved 400 passenger miles per gallon, far more than any aircraft that's commercially available now. And we think we blew the doors open on electric aviation. So you, know, you think of the amount of carbon put into the atmosphere every year by aircraft. And some of the research we do at NASA helps reduce that, but ultimately there's a lot that goes on there. This kind of technology is going to make a huge difference. But that's for, for air. And, and to go, go back to space just for a second, um, you know, on the lower right here is this really interesting technology. You saw that complicated sky crane arrangement, right? That was this, um, these four jets that dropped the rover uh, on sort of cables and released and flew away. It all seemed very Byzantine, probably, and complicated and needlessly strange. And, and you're thinking, man, couldn't they have come up with something else? Uh, maybe, but if you, if you look closely at that and the details, and I have, um, that's about the best we can do. You know, we've used airbags, we've used parachutes, we've used retropropulsion. That's the best we can do, is to land about 1,000 kilograms on the surface of Mars. We think that to land a person on the surface of Mars, and I'm ready to sign up, by the way, but to land a person probably takes about 50,000 kilograms. That is, uh, all the infrastructure and so forth necessary to make that work. One landing, 50,000 kilograms, and maybe several landings like it. So we're far away from being able to do that. So we need new technology to make that possible. On the lower right there is some of that technology. That's a hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator. It's essentially a heat shield that travels at Mach 10, but it's a balloon. It's extremely lightweight. So imagine you know, holding a balloon out of your car, right, as you're going down the highway at highway speeds. Imagine it fluttering and maybe even popping, whipping out of your hand. Okay, now I'll increase that speed by a factor of a couple hundred. Um, and that's what this balloon has to undergo. So not that long ago, about a month ago, we actually demonstrated this. A uh, launch called Irv-3, if you're paying attention, uh, that actually did launch it to high altitude, re-entered the atmosphere of Earth, uh, where at a certain slice of the atmosphere we actually mimic the Mars re-entry dynamics, and it works. With this one, we are capable already of 2,000 kilograms to the surface of Mars, just with a modest technology investment. And we think we might be able to push to as much as 10,000 kilograms just through this general technology. Still a factor of five, though, so we're looking for ideas. But you know, as, as important as Mars is, it turns out the highest priority for us, and it's a long story where this comes from, is access to space. So any of you out there, how, how many of you would actually like to put your own hardware into space? And you just see your hands. Who would like to do that? Yeah, so a large number of people, and I, I feel the same way. You know, until just recently, I was a professor at Cornell University, and I had a number of flight projects going with students. It's kind of expensive to try to put a spacecraft into space. Uh, you know, it's something like $100,000 for something the size of a grapefruit. These are called CubeSats, by the way, if you haven't heard of these. Uh, it can be done, 
$100,000 is not the kind of pocket change we walk around with, right? At least I don't. Maybe some of you do here. And so don't raise your hand. You know, this is New York City, and it's, you know, just saying. Um, but no, that, that's, that's one of the issues. It's, it's the cost of access to space. So I don't think it's actually a technology problem. I think it's an economics problem. Uh, it, historically, we, uh, by we I mean NASA, but then also the community of people who care about reaching space have tended to focus on what I'll call the supply side of this problem. That is, trying to create a better launch vehicle, a cheaper launch vehicle. Uh, what's shown here is a SpaceX rocket. Uh, they've had a lot of success recently. You probably followed the story of their launching their Dragon capsule to dock with the International Space Station and returning that to Earth and re-entering it, uh, landing in the ocean, all successfully. First time a commercial company has done that. Um, it's an exciting time for us, but this does reduce the cost to orbit, but only by, by maybe a factor of two or three, depending on, on how you do the math. We need more like a factor of a thousand, I think, for all of us to be able to uh, put our own hobbies into space, our own cell phones into space, um, whatever we want to into space. In other words, for us to become a spacefaring species, that's the kind of change it makes, it, or, that it requires. So what's that going to take? I think we need to focus on the demand for space. So right now it's a chicken and egg problem, right? You don't launch your, uh, your hardware into space because it's too expensive. And it's so expensive because there's not much demand for launching things into space. So how do we out overcome that kind of vicious cycle? Well, I think it's, it involves some killer apps. I'd like to think that today I'm talking to the people who will come up with those solutions for helping us build our way into space. Coming up with things that we can do in space that everybody wants. The thneed, if you like, of space. What is that thing that everybody needs, everybody wants? What's the, you know, what would have been a cell phone 10 years ago, 15 years ago, a PC 30 years ago? What is that thing that we all need in space? What can we not do without? Now, it's not GPS, because I'll tell you, GPS uh, exists. It's not really a space thing. It uses satellites, but we use it on the ground, right? What is it that we have to use in space? What requires hardware in space? If we come up with that, we increase the demand for launch vehicles, and despite what you've heard, increasing demand drops the price, of launch vehicles, eventually maybe it comes up again, but you know uh, we need to drop that price for launch vehicles, not just as a matter of engagement of the public, but actually as a matter of how we can do more science, more exploration, and again, become a spacefaring species, if that's our goal. I contend that there is a revolution coming in that area. I contend maybe it's already here. Uh, in fact, it might be underway right now. We don't realize it. Uh, people in this room, if any of you actually worked on a CubeSat or a small satellite of some kind before? I know, Matt, you have. I see you right there. All right, so um, that's a small number. I'm telling you now, though, that there are ways in which you can do so that are not as expensive as you might think. So here are pictures of some CubeSats. They are really about the size of a grapefruit. But you know, to be honest, as cool as this is, the notion that you could maybe build and launch something for $100,000, again, that's still kind of expensive. It's also an idea that's been around for a while, say a good 15 years, uh, that this has been a uh, well-understood idea. And for the last five years, it's been absolutely mainstream. Most major research universities in the nation with aerospace engineering programs have some kind of CubeSat activity going on. They're building spacecraft and launching them themselves. You know, you know, when I was that age, I couldn't have hoped to launch my senior project, but now that's in fact possible when you're in college. So it's a low-cost, hacker-friendly spacecraft standard. Um, it's Arduino-friendly. It uses COTS parts. There's actually several startup companies providing components for these CubeSats. It's one of the most commonly built types of spacecraft in the world just because there are it's so inexpensive, and there's so many people who would like to get into space. Now, we followed the lead of citizen innovators in this case and embraced that standard. It does, in fact, have an open source nature to it. It's got a standard. You look it up, download a few pages from the internet, learn what it's all about, build to that standard, and then launch it. What I'm here to tell you is that NASA can launch your CubeSats for free. So, what did you say? What? I was looking at my program. What? Uh, I said, I can launch them for free. All right, NASA has a program now, the CubeSat Launch Initiative. The Alana program allows you to apply to NASA, working with a university, and launch your CubeSat for free. I think in the last round, we uh, accepted something like 20, 25 satellites for only about 35, 40 applicants. So the hit rate is very high. Um, think about that. So you have an opportunity there. And there's more opportunities. So uh, here's a couple of Kickstarter projects, not to pick on any particular ones, but they're two I happen to know something about. Um, there are several different DIY spacecraft projects that have gone on. Some have raised over $100,000. Uh, these, you know, Zach on the left there, he had a notion of a, a PCB uh, satellite. It's got its own solar cells, 
Uh, this one uses an MSP430, but he's making an Arduino version, and a few other things. Uh, you'll be able to program it with your own sequence of ASCII characters. It'll transmit to the ground for you. It's kind of a Sputnik for the year 2012, let's say. So, yeah, it doesn't do a whole lot, but, you know, for like 25 bucks, you get to put one of these things into space. That's not bad. 25, I would argue, is better than $100,000. Uh, ArduSat is, is analogous. Here, this is your Arduino experiment in space, so very much embracing the Arduino standard. And then I take it, packaging them in a single CubeSat, launching them, and they deploy from there, and then so on and so forth. Um, there are others as well. So whether you want to sign up with one of these guys or do your own Kickstarter version, uh, I'll tell you that the uh, open source nature of that CubeSat standard is actually enabling people to put things into space. Zach is going to embed about 300 of his uh, chipset uh, uh, spacecraft into a what they call a 3U CubeSat, so three of these units together, size of a loaf of bread, uh, and deploy those. And again, he'll get uh, a NASA opportunity to do that. So uh, an exciting time, I think, because yes, you can put your own stuff into space. That roadblock that you may think is there, I think is maybe not there. Uh, I think if you want to launch anything you want, something the size of, oh, I don't know, me, that's harder to come up with, all right? Harder to come up with that money. But I think this is the wedge, or as they say, the camel's nose under the tent. Uh, poking into this, uh, into the space, uh, this, the space economy to build something for the future. So citizen space, there's a lot of stuff going on. One of the, uh, one of the exciting trends is NASA centers creating fab labs, or hacker spaces, for fabricating spacecraft. So NASA Ames, um, has something they call the Space Shop, which is all about this, and sorry for the crummy picture, but this is a, um, it's made out of uh, ABS or some other kind of plastic, 3D printed spacecraft. Just think what it would mean if rather than launching spacecraft with all their exquisitely built, uh, handmade hardware, rather than launching that sort of thing at a price greater than gold per kilogram, what if we could just make it in space? One thing that would mean is the spacecraft wouldn't have to undergo the launch forces and vibration that typical spacecraft do. So you can get rid of most of the structure. And, you know, one of the things was about spacecraft is one, if they break in space, you can't go fix them. We've fixed the Hubble Space Telescope several times at the cost of about half a billion dollars a shot. You know, and that's uh, expensive. So um, instead, what if you could just print up replacement parts? So uh, again, embracing this, this approach of uh, individuals being able to fabricate things also means for us an ability to rethink the paradigm what it means to put something into space, what it means for space hardware. So we've got a number of programs at, at NASA focused on innovation. Some very much focus on the citizen space problem. Others uh, treat the, the broader range of technology programs. And I, I, to be honest, I'm not going to go through all these. It'll be a little dull. I will point out one in particular, one of my favorites, so that, although they are all in some way my favorites. Um, it's the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, NIAC, right in the middle there. There, we're looking for ideas that are at least a decade out, maybe more like two or three decades in the future. Uh, but anybody can apply. Uh, $100,000 for a nine-month effort, followed by $500,000 for a two-year effort. That's the phase one, phase two sequence. Um, anybody in this room is welcome to apply. In fact, I want you guys to be offering us very new ideas. Uh, we get ideas from everywhere, uh, individual citizen inventors, small businesses. Rarely, though, do we get large companies just because the money's not worth it for them. But that's where we're able to actually reach into the other 99% and get other kinds of ideas. We might get ideas like, for example, oh, I don't know, Tom Ditto, who had this great idea of building a uh, new kind of telescope uh, based on, uh, on uh, ref uh, refraction grading optics. Wonderful idea. I wish you were here today. I'd, oh, it, there he is. Hey, Tom, what's up? So anyway, Tom, a, uh, a NIAC fellow, and thanks for, thanks for coming, by the way. So uh, really exciting possibilities in there, and again, I could uh, geek out of, over the specific ones, and maybe you can ask me some questions later, but I will point out that there are a number of opportunities here. If you go to nasa.gov slash OCT, you'll find out ways in which you can engage with NASA on innovative space technology, whether it's through prize competitions or things like NIAC, where we have formally funded uh, programs. Uh, let me mention a few things about prizes before wrapping up. You know, of course, they have a long track record of spurring innovation. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Ansari X Prize that led to the development of Spaceship One and, and other things that uh, maybe you could argue kickstarted our uh, space tourism age. Um, if you look at the aggregate prize purses that are over $100,000 over the last few years, starting from 1970, you know, a few. Look how this has changed uh, just in this decade. From 2000 to 2005, uh, half a million dollars available through this sort of stuff. There are individual prizes available uh, through NASA worth a million dollars and some more. Uh, just recently we had a, um, 
uh, nanosat, uh, sorry, a um, sample return rover challenge. It was the challenge was held at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Uh, we had about seven teams available there. Only one made it because the rest weren't finished. The one didn't do very much yet. We're hoping for better results next year. This is a wide open field. If you'd like to get one million dollars, you can apply to be part of the uh, sample return robot challenge. There are others too. Uh, we get it, uh, results from unexpected places. Um, a uh, retired radio engineer from New Hampshire uh, came up with a new astronaut glove. I'm sorry, uh, this is a different person, sorry. This one, uh, for, an algorithm to forecast America's astronauts' uh, radiation exposure. Uh, we have been able to do that with some success. We got a better idea from uh, this person who's familiar with radio technology that we weren't familiar with. Uh, he got a prize for that. An algorithm for mapping dark matter. Um, and then the green flight challenge, which I mentioned before. The one I was actually referring to before was Peter Homer from Maine, one of those northeastern states, you know, whatever. Um, Peter Homer from Maine. Um, uh, he came up with an astronaut glove uh, that won a competition, uh, $200,000. So these prizes are ways that we can engage, frankly, much more cost effectively than we do in other areas with citizen inventors to get great new ideas that move our space program forward. All right, so there are other challenges coming up. One I'll mention for those of you interested in rockets is the NanoSat launch challenge, uh, maybe a million dollars for coming up with a way to launch these small satellites, uh, NanoSats of some kind, maybe CubeSats, um, using a reusable technology of some kind. Uh, again, details are on the web, running out of time, so I will answer questions if necessary. CubeSat launch initiative is here. Go to nasa.gov directorates and look for CubeSats initiative. So here's my call to action for you. I contend, and I hope you believe me, uh, that NASA continues to dream big and address challenges for our nation. Some of you out there think NASA's done because we don't have the space shuttle anymore. I think nothing could be further from the truth. At this moment, and has been the case for a long time, there are six astronauts orbiting the Earth, doing amazing science and technology on our space station. When we invest in space technology, though, it's not only about achieving the arguably lofty and distant goals of space science and a few humans exploring space we're actually adding to what we do nationally. Uh, we're developing our own national competitiveness. We're adding to what we call the innovation economy. And what I'd like to think is, by investing in space technology, we are actually spurring the growth of new businesses, maybe some led by people here in the audience today, for space technology for the next decade. So we're embracing the citizen space uh, and citizen science approaches to things. As I've already explained, we have a number of programs that actually give you money, yes, money, uh, to make this happen. And my call to action to you is this. Help us create those killer apps for consumer space. Let's make space an economy, something in which we need to engage for the sake of our future, because I think access to space is what's going to benefit. We'll end up being able to launch more, do more science, and then ultimately humans to space, which I would like to see in my lifetime. So the future needs you. I welcome your questions. Thanks. Go ahead. Sure, well, so the CubeSat standard, it's uh, 10 centimeters by 10 by 10, so hence a cube, about that big. Uh, one kilogram in mass. Yes, we speak in metric because it's, it's math that makes sense, I'm sorry. Um, you know, what can I tell you? Uh, so um, the other thing that you have to do is conform with the standard that allows you, them to be launched within what they call a P pod. It's a long story where that name comes from, but you stack three of them into a kind of a spring-loaded container and they pop out uh, in space. You can't have volatile chemicals, things that explode. Uh, you can't have a lot of uh, power on board. Uh, you can charge up batteries after it launches, but you can't have a lot of stored energy. Um, all this is because these CubeSats will be launched as secondary payloads, the primary payload being some, I don't know what, NASA satellite or defense satellite or commercial, you know, ComSat, um, because that's where you can squeeze in a few extra kilograms to get some, uh, some launch. And they will launch to wherever they launch to. I mean, that's the thing. You're hitching a ride. So I mean, some of us have probably hitchhiked before, right? Uh, you go where you go. Uh, and so for CubeSat, that'll be maybe to low Earth orbit, probably to low Earth orbit. But there are opportunities to launch to, for example, geostationary transfer orbit. And if you can really come up with some good technology, it takes about 800 meters per second of change in velocity, delta V in a, in a rocket sense, to be able to escape from one of those geostationary transfer orbits into an interplanetary trajectory. So you're only about 800 meters per second of speed away from an interplanetary DIY spacecraft. And I'd like to see that happen soon. Yes? Um, 
the question was, what do I see NASA's role as in a future where um, space exploration is done by private companies? I think we will always have a role in uh, doing those things that individuals and private companies can't or won't do. And that's the role of a government. It's the reason why we don't have complete anarchy. We pull together to invest in some things that otherwise we couldn't invest in. We wouldn't have a space program if it weren't for the collective investment of all of our tax dollars over the years. Right? So I think that's one reason why we do these publicly engaged things. Um, but commercial space, I think, has a very important future. I think it's going to grow as commercial aviation did. So I would like to see it follow that same trend. Same thing with computation. I mean, computation, computers, they were built for defense purposes around the 1930s, 1940s, and they've become consumer now, and the government is buying them back from the consumer world. So I'd like to see space uh, see that, follow that same trend. And we're making moves toward that. You know, we have programs at NASA that are en enabling our commercial capabilities in space to launch astronauts and supplies to the space station. That's actually one thing that SpaceX will be doing for us, as well as other companies like Blue Origin and, and others. Maybe one more question? Yes. So the qu yeah, question is, uh, how can we work harder to make sure that NASA know, uh, people know, people of the country know what NASA has done for you? Uh, I'm sorry that that's not been successful because it's one of my jobs at NASA. <laughs> um, one thing I can say uh, for, the, for the time being, you should check out spinoff.nasa.gov uh, as, as a way to see some of those examples. Um, I gave testimony before Congress about a month and a half ago on exactly this point. What has NASA done for you? And if we had another hour, I could <laughs> tell you a number of things. It goes way beyond uh, Tang, which, by the way, was not a NASA thing. Um, I'll give you one example, and that's baby food. About 95% of the baby food consumed uh, worldwide includes within it fatty acids that were developed as part of a program to develop better nutrition for astronauts in space. Those uh, compounds turn out to promote uh, brain development and nervous system development in newborns. So in fact, the, our investment in the Apollo program has led to healthier and smarter kids all over the world. It's just one example. So even though the specific examples themselves maybe aren't the compelling reason to invest in space, I think whenever we invest in something hard, something difficult to achieve, we get all these spin-off effects. So there's a real reason for us as a nation to be investing in technology, whether that's through NASA or the Department of Energy or the National Science Foundation. When we invest in hard problems, this is what Kennedy said, right? We go to the moon and choose to do these things because they're hard, not because they're easy. When we solve hard problems, we come up with other things as a result, as a natural consequence, as you all know, uh, having worked in, in, maker, in the maker community for a while. Anyway, I need to get off the stage. Thanks very much. Thank you.